I would like to introduce our, uh, and welcome our first speaker, Dr. Richard Primack to the stage. Dr. Primack uh, is the author of the well-known book, Walden Warming. He is currently a professor of biology at Boston University. His work focuses on the effects of climate change on the flowering, leafing out, fruiting, and leaf senescence times of plants, the migration times of birds, and the flight times of insects in Massachusetts, and on the, and the potential for ecological mismatches among species caused by changes, changes in timing. His projects use the phenological and species abundance records kept by Henry David Thoreau and other naturalists in comparison with long-term changes in Acadia National Park. Dr. Primack rece uh, received his BA at Harvard University in 1972. Did you want me to say the year? Uh, and his PhD at Duke University in 76. He served a, as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Canterbury and Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Primack is also the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Biological Conservation, and he publishes conservation biology textbooks and collaborates with co-authors to produce textbooks in other languages. His talk here today is titled, Using Historical Records Combined with Modern Records to Track the Effects of Climate Change on the Plants and Animals of Thoreau's Concord. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Primack. It's a great pleasure to be here. I think this is a very exciting conference because it shows the connections between ecology, ecosystem science, forestry, and climate change. So this is a very exciting uh, intersection of all these fields, which is creating a lot of energy within the field of biology, ecology, and also connecting to forestry. So I'm going to talk to you today about the research that my students and I have been doing for the last 17 years. This research began in 2002 when I was working on the latest edition of my textbook in conservation biology, and there were no real good, thorough, well-worked-out examples of the effects of climate change from anywhere in the eastern United States. So all of the examples in my textbooks and people were talking about were always polar bears in northern Canada, it was wildflowers in the mountains of Switzerland, and we had no examples from the eastern United States. But if climate change is global climate change, we should be seeing examples everywhere, not just in northern Canada. So 17 years ago, we decided to stop doing our research in tropical ecology and switch over to looking for the effects of climate change here in the northeast United States. So all of you are, I'm sure, are convinced of climate change, and you can see it, but 17 years ago, it was not so apparent about how climate change was actually affecting the biological communities of this region. So what I'm going to do is to share with you today what my colleagues and students and I have found out for this region and also share with you some of the techniques. Many of these techniques which we started working on 17 years ago were pretty unusual, but now many of you have heard of them. Uh, but still, I'd like to share with you what we've found out over this time. And again, the mic's still not on, so I'm going to get my have to turn around here as I show these slides. Okay, well, the first important point, the first important point which uh, all of you now know is that climate change is a reality here in terms of the warming temperatures. And the Boston and New England region have among not only the best documented rising temperatures, but also this region has actually had a lot more temperature increase than other regions of the United States. So we've had about a two degree centigrade increase in temperature in contrast, oh, it's on now, okay? in contrast to the warming temperatures of about one degrees for the rest of the United States. And we have extremely good weather records from the Blue Hills Observatory and many other observatories in the New England region. And so, if you, New England has, of course, famously variable temperature, but the temperature trend is clearly on the rise, and it's about two degrees centigrade. But the thing we have to appreciate is that not only is global warm, not only is climate change referring to warming temperatures, but also the rainfall patterns are increasing. So New England also has an increasing amount of rainfall, increased amount of precipitation over the last um, 150 years, but also increasing droughts, so periods of drought, but in general, greater rainfall. Also, sea levels are rising, maybe less applicable to many people in Vermont and forests here, uh, but in many coastal areas we have rising sea levels, but also CO2 levels are rising, and this has really largely unknown consequences for the forests of this region. So CO2 levels are rising and the trees need this for their growth, and, and this is a connection which needs to be investigated. So you can see the effects of climate change uh, in many physical systems. So among the most documented systems are wind, 
ponds and lakes thaw in the spring. And people have been looking at when the ice thaws at Walden Pond in Concord, where Thoreau lived. They've been watching this for 150 years. And Walden Pond used to thaw at the end of March and the beginning of April. And now it thaws really in the middle of March or sometimes even in February in some years. So it's a physical manifestation of climate change. But our group is really a biological group, so we're interested in the effects of climate change on plants and animals of New England. And what we're concerned with is how climate change is affecting the biodiversity of this region. And we could include forests as part of this biodiversity in all forest processes, and ecosystem processes. And the second question that we began to address is why should we care about this? And of course, all of you know if the forests are unhealthy, that means we're not going to get as much wood and we're not going to get the ecosystem services. But also many endangered species will be harmed by a climate change. And then the third question is really what are we going to do about it? Are we just going to take this information and write papers about it? Or are we going to try to use this to manage forests and to protect endangered species? So these are things that we were thinking about. We also, as university uh, uh, researchers, also were very concerned with spreading the message of climate change and making the public aware of the realities of climate change. Um, in the Boston area, we're particularly concerned about rising sea level. This is a map of Boston. Uh, this shows where Boston University is, and this is where downtown Boston is, Beacon Hill is. And this is a map showing what will happen to Boston if it gets hit by a flood, by a hurricane at high tide in approximately the year 2050, when the sea levels will have risen by another foot or so. And you can see that most of Boston, including everything between the university and downtown Boston, will be underwater, large areas of Cambridge and Somerville, the whole airport, and South Boston will all be underwater. And so these are some of the extreme really serious consequences of climate change. But of course, given this conference, it's also very serious for the forest. So all the forest products and amenities and ecosystem processes, ecosystem services, will be threatened by climate change. So as biologists, we're concerned with how do we detect the biological effects of climate change. And there are these three key indicators of climate change. One is on the timing of events in the spring, the phenology. And this is probably where we have the most information about the effects of climate change on forest ecosystems. The second one is on the distribution of species. So of course, trees don't move around a lot, but birds and butterflies are very sensitive to temperature, and their distributions uh, might be changing. The third indicator is on the abundance of species. So whether species become more common, or in the case of trees, whether to what extent trees are increasing or decreasing their growth rates based on climate change. So this is what we began investigating 17 years ago. And the way to most effectively study these is to find old records and then repeat old records in modern times, or even better, find a study where someone started monitoring something a long time ago and continued monitoring it up until the present time. So 17 years ago, we began to look for old records in the New England region. Um, and we put an incredible effort into searching for old records, going to universities, libraries. We went to all the small scientific societies we have in the Boston area, asking people if they knew of any information. We just started asking everybody we knew, and what it would in this terms. We went around the Boston area, putting up notices in supermarkets and libraries. Uh, and we found that there's a lot of information out there when you look. And this is actually one of the important messages that I want to tell you today, is that if you go and look for old information, you often find it. And it's often kind of in old libraries, old kind of back offices of field stations or forestry stations, um, often very senior professors or researchers just have a lot of stuff in their file cabinets. And if you find this stuff, it's often extremely valuable. So of all the old records that we found, I mean, we found so many old records of things that happened in the past. But of all the records we found, the best records were the records that were gathered by Henry David Thoreau in the 1850s in Concord. Of course, Henry David Thoreau was very famous as an environmental philosopher and the person who wrote the book Walden. But he kept very detailed records from the 1850s in his unpublished journals. These records were well known to literary scholars, but they were not known to biologists. So when we discovered these records in 2003, we were floored, and we immediately knew that these would be extremely valuable for climate change research. Interestingly enough, the literary people knew that they would be valuable for climate change research, and they were just waiting for biologists to get in touch with them. But who knew? I mean, who knew if they had them? 
so this is an example of what Thoreau's uh, records look like. So this is one of his journals in black writing. Um, and Thoreau actually coined the word realometer. So it's a kind of a combination of reality and reader. So he said, you know, that observations can be a realometer. And now we're using Thoreau's records as a realometer to detect the effects of climate change. So this is Thoreau's journal in black. So this is one of his uh, journal pages from 1857. And this is actually from May of 1857. The numbers on the left are days in May when he had first observed plants flowering in Concord on that day. And his writing is extremely messy. He often uses common names and he switches over to scientific names. His names are different from our names. So it took us like several years to figure out what his names were and to put them into an Excel spreadsheet. And then in blue is what, what, what I think he's using as a name. So I'm writing the scientific name or the common name above his name in blue to help in this sort of effort to uh, put this into an Excel spreadsheet. So he looked at common cultivated and wild plants throughout Concord for an eight year period in Concord. And what my students and I did was to, starting in 2004, was to go to Concord and repeat these same observations that Thoreau made in Concord, looking for the first flowering of particular plant species in Concord. We started to focus after a while on spring flowering wildflowers, common spring flowering wildflowers, since they're very sensitive to temperature. Also, we found that there was another botanist in Concord, another actually a storekeeper in Concord, named Alfred Hosmer, who also started to repeat Thoreau's observations. So we had Hosmer's observations from 1878 to 1902. And this is a summary of our work. So each one of these dots on this graph represents a field season. So you just think about how much work went into this very simple figure. So each one of those dots is a, a field season for a team of biologists going around in Concord and recording the first flowering time of wildflowers. Each one of these dots represents the average flowering time for 32 common wildflower species in Concord. We went through the Thoreau's years, Hosmer's years, and our years from 1850s to the present time. And we show um, the dates in May when we have the average flowering time. And so you can see there's a lot of variation in terms of when plants were flowering in Concord. But in general, plants flowered around May 16th in Thoreau's years, around May 11th in Hosmer's years, and around May 6th in our years. So even though they go out to Concord, and it looks very pristine, it looks like a colonial landscape which hasn't changed. Of course, the foresters, so you know that in Thoreau's time it was largely deforested, and now it's largely forested of course, but it still looks like a very natural place, but in fact, it's showing the effects of climate change. So a two degrees centigrade increase in temperature is driving this increase, this earlier flowering time. We do have certain years, so for example, these unusual years, so this is in 2010 and 2012, those were off the charts warm springs, and those extremely warm springs, the plants responded by flowering earlier. And we can show this data in a different way by looking, instead of the effects of time, the changes over time, we look at the effects of changes in spring temperature on when plants flowering, with the flowering. So this is exactly the same data, but instead of looking at changes of time, it's changes of flowering in relationship to spring temperature. And on this graph here we have Thoreau's years in blue, Hosmer's years in yellow, and our years in red. And you can see that Plants are flowering earlier because of warming temperatures. So this is what's driving the change, not changes in land use, changes in precipitation, changes in anything else in temperature. When it's a very warm, when it's a very cold spring, the plants flower late. And when it's a very warm spring, the plants flower early. We were very curious to see the effects of um, what would happen in 2012 and 2010. And these were these astonishingly early, astonishingly warm springs. So would the plants respond in a linear fashion, or would in some ways it be so warm that the plants weren't getting enough winter chilling requirement, and therefore might start flowering later? And then we found that it it's still largely a linear response. That in the winter, at least, at least we have so much cold that when the spring comes, it's really the plants are responding to the spring warming, and as it continues to get warmer, plants continue to respond earlier in terms of their spring biology. We found that there's a lot of other sources of data out there which can be used to detect the effects of climate change and tell the story of climate change. And one of these is herbarium specimens. So New England is astonishingly, New England and the Northeast United States is astonishingly uh, 
has an astonishing abundance of herbarium specimens. So these are museum specimens which are collected and flattened and pasted onto herbarium sheets, and they have labels saying where they were collected, who collected them, and the date that they were collected. And what we've done is we've matched hundreds of these herbarium specimens with when plants are flowering on the grounds of the Arnold Arboretum um, in Boston. And what we're able to do is, because these plants from the Arnold Arboretum actually have the number they were collected from, we can match these specimens with the exact same plant that they were collected from. So this herbarium specimen here was collected in full flower on May 19th, 1938. And this is the exact plant that it was collected from, which is flowering on May 3rd, 2010. And so by matching all these herbarium specimens in full flower with when the species are flowering on the grounds of the arboretum today, we can again see the effects of climate change. And this is a great way to reach a different audience about climate change. So this reaches the audience of people who like cultivated plants and who like beautiful flowers. I also want to mention that our group is very conscious of reaching the public. And so we actually uh, made it a point to take this photograph in front of what I think is the most beautiful plant at the Art of Arboretum, the Vaseyes Azalea. And we took about 500 versions of this picture with different people and different lighting regimes just so that we had a great picture. So when journalists talk to us, not only do we have a good story, but we have great photographs. And therefore, they're more likely to write about our story because we have great visuals to go with it. So I'm sure this group, as a group of foresters, is probably thinking, what about trees? And it turns out that there's a lot of information out there about when trees leaf out in the spring. And that also Thoreau recorded when trees leafed out in Concord. And we've repeated those information, those same observations, over the last 12 years. And the trees are now leafing out about two weeks earlier now than they did in the past in Concord. And they're actually responding more strongly to climate change than the wildflowers. And this means that the window that wildflowers have of full sunlight on the forest floor before the trees leaf out is actually getting narrower in Concord. And that has really very strong effects on the energy budgets of these wildflowers, which might affect their ability to mature their fruit or to flower in the future. And this is something that we're investigating very actively. It's called an ecological mismatch. And this, this observation also leads us to wonder how do plants know when to leaf out in the spring? And it's the surprisingly little information about when tr or how trees know that, that it's spring. But you can do very simple sets of experiments that we've begun to do in our laboratory. And these experiments, which I urge all of you to do because they're really easy to do and they're really fun and they're really kind of interesting to the public, if you collect dormant twigs from trees in January, February, March, and April, you bring them into the laboratory and you expose them to different temperatures or even just room temperature, and some of them you can put under lights to simulate kind of the longer days of spring, and some of them you can just put under ambient light, and you see whether they leaf out or not. And it turns out the trees need a winter chilling requirement. They need to go through a certain number of months before they leaf out, and they need to be exposed to a certain amount of warmth. And then some of them, but not most of them, also need a longer increasing photo period. So these are very simple experiments that you can do to see how trees know when to leaf out in the spring. Uh, another source of information that we've discovered are photographs. We often are enormous collections of photographs in the northeastern region, and you can use photographs to see the effects of climate change. And we encountered a woman who had an enormous collection of photographs taken at historically important cemeteries on Memorial Day. And she said that of all, in her whole photograph collection, there was one photograph that looked really different. And that's this photograph on the left. So that was taken on May 30th, 1868. And the, the photograph on the right is as close as I, it was as close as I could get to taking the same view of that place, but and again, on May 30th of 2005. And this photograph on the left looks really strange. And why does it look strange? No leaves. There's no leaves. So it turns out that 1868 was a year with no spring. It was an extremely cold year in which there were freezing temperatures in uh, April, May, and June. And so either the trees had not leafed out yet because it was so cold, or they had started to leaf out and, and, the, and the leaves were killed by a late frost. So in 1868, in the, in the 1850s and the 1860s when Thoreau lived, it was a time of cold. Sometimes it was the end of the period known as the Little Ice Age. 
And people were concerned that if the temperature just got a little bit colder, that all the crops would fail and people would starve to death or freeze in the wintertime. And now we're at kind of an, another extreme of this view of temperature, we, where if the temperature gets a little bit warmer, people are concerned again that crops will fail, that there will be rising sea level, which will flood cities. And also U.S. foresters realize that if the temperature gets a little bit warmer, it poses a severe threat to the forests of this region. Uh, we've also been looking for bird data, and I can tell you that there is a vast amount of bird data out there. So most of the data sets we encounter, we analyze very fully, but there's actually so much bird data out there when you go looking for it that we never completely analyze all the data that was offered to us, and we just analyze the best bird data. There's an enormous amount of bird data out there, and we use this data to ask if birds are responding to climate change and if they are responding in the same way that plants are. And what we found, analyzing many data sets, is that birds are mostly only either not responding to climate change yet, or they're only responding just a little bit. So birds are not as responsive to climate change because they're migrating from Central America or South America, and they also don't know what the temperature is in this region. They also don't migrate when there's a headwind or when it's raining. So they are responding to climate change, but just much less strongly as, this, as the plants are. And you can put all this information by thinking about how groups are responding differently to climate change. And this shows a graph of a lot of our different data sets, looking at how species are responding to a warming temperature. So we have a warming temperature on the x-axis and the dates in the spring. And it shows you that of all these three groups of trees, wildflowers, and birds, that trees by far have the strongest response to climate change. They respond very strongly to warming temperatures. Wildflowers also have a response, but it's not as strong. As I mentioned, this lead, could lead to an ecological mismatch. But what's really striking is that birds are responding very little, only to a small degree or not at all, to the effects of warming temperature. And this could result in an ecological mismatch between plants and birds, but it's something that we don't really know in practice whether it's actually going to, whether it is actually occurring. And the connection between birds and plants is insects, because when birds arrive in the spring, they're eating insects, and when insects emerge in the spring, they're feeding on plants. And so this is a very active area of research right now, and, and as the results that have come out so far suggest that insects are responding very strongly to climate change in the same way that plants are. But over the last one year, there's been this amazing series of articles published in the literature which demonstrate that insects are under severe decline now as a result of human activity. And so throughout the world, wherever people have been monitoring insects, they see that insect groups have declined both in terms of species diversity and biomass. And the consequences to, of this to birds and forest health is, is still unclear. I should mention that this is not for invasive insects, which are obviously increasing. This is for native insects. There's a study which is about to come out, or maybe just came out a few weeks ago, just describing the incredible loss of, of insects at Hubbardwick Experimental Forest um, in New Hampshire as one example. Also, there's been a tremendous loss of wildflower species from the forests of the northeastern region. Um, this was demonstrated in a paper published just a few months ago uh, by Caitlin McDonough McKenzie. She surveyed all the places in the northeast United States where there was a, an historical flora which was then resurveyed. And she has found that there is a tremendous loss of wildflower species, even in places which are well protected in this region. The place that I know best is Concord, Massachusetts. And Concord is very unusual. There have been five floras of Concord. And as far as we can tell, there's been a loss of about 27% of the wildflower species which are present in Concord. This is very surprising because Concord is a very well protected landscape. One third of it is strictly protected and two, thousand, two thirds of it is still in a natural condition. And yet, there has been this loss of about 27% of the species. And about another 35% of the species in Concord are declining. There's a lot of reasons for this decline, many of which I'm sure you know already, like habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, um, air pollution, nitrogen deposition, um, invasive species, 
do. But also, climate change is one of the causes of this decline. And we've seen this both in Concord and other places in Massachusetts. And we know this because the species which have been lost have been disproportionately the cold-loving northern species, and also species which are not responding as much to climate change in terms of their phenology. So we know that climate change is already affecting the wildflower diversity of these forests. And certain groups are particularly susceptible. So for example, orchids are disproportionately being lost. So in Concord, there were originally 21 species of orchids in Concord, and all the field work we've done in Concord, we've only seen seven of them. And this is a universal trend that orchids and certain other groups like lilies are particularly susceptible to all of these habitat factors. And also I should mention that we, we now have a, a large body of evidence showing that Bird abundance is changing, so birds are increasing in abundance relating to a warmer climate, and also insects are changing their distribution. So in general, even though insects are declining, we see a lot of southern species or butterflies arriving now in the northeastern region, which historically were not here. So we've talked about all the things which have been happening so far, but this system is going to continue to change. So if we look at climate change projections, of course we're right about here, right now, so in the year about 220. And we've already had about globally about one degree increase, one degree centigrade increase in temperature globally, already about two degrees centigrade increase in the northeastern region. But we are predicted to have temperatures continuing in to increase as we continue to burn fossil fuels and cut down tropical rainforest as the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continue to increase, the global temperatures will continue to increase. So if I was talking about five years ago, I would have said we're probably on track for this lower prediction of about a two degree centigrade increase in temperature. But because the United States has pulled out of the uh, climate change agreement, because uh, many countries continue to increase the amount of carbon dioxide they're producing and as their economies develop, countries like China and India, we're probably closer on track to this three degree centigrade increase in temperature. And what does that mean for the climate of this region? So when I was growing up in Massachusetts, Massachusetts had a climate like Massachusetts. But Massachusetts no longer has a Massachusetts climate. Of course, we're in Vermont here, so we can probably say the same of Vermont. So we no longer have a Vermont climate. So if we just look at, well, we look at Massachusetts. So Massachusetts has a climate currently like northern New Jersey had when I was growing up. And as climate change continues to increase, Massachusetts by the end of the century will have a climate like southern North Carolina. So I spent four years at Duke University, and I remember going to sleep at night in, in a house that didn't have air conditioning, just sweating and being barely able to sleep because it was so hot as I was lying in my bed sweating at night. And this is really what the future is of the Northeast United States. It's going to get three or four or five degrees centigrade warmer by the end of the century. It's going to have a southern climate. And that means that so many of the trees, shrubs, wildflowers, and animals of this region are not going to be able to survive. And it's going to mean outbreaks of insect pests and, and other diseases in this region because of this warming climate. As a biologist, as, as a plant ecologist, I'm particularly interested in endangered species. And one of the most amazing species in the world is the Venus flytrap. It turns out that the one place that the Venus flytrap lives is right here on the green swamp in North Carolina. And it's probably not going to be able to survive in this place by the end of the century because it's going to get too hot and too dry for it in North Carolina. And the place in the United States which is probably going to be best suited to the Venus flytrap is New England. So that's the place where it will grow. And if we think about protecting endangered species, we, of course we need to protect the endangered species of the New England region, and we should try to protect them here. But a lot of them are going to go extinct because it's going to become too hot for them here and too, the conditions will be too altered. And we also need to think about trying to protect species from further south of here that might be migrating here. And the problem that the Venus flytrap has is it has a very localized distribution that's not very common, and it's just a little plant that's, whose seeds fall on the ground. And so we need to think about moving the Venus flytrap further north in a process which is called assisted migration or assisted colonization. Because if we don't do this, if we don't actively try to manage the Venus flytrap, we're just going to watch it go extinct in coming decades. 
So a few thoughts about future directions of research. Well, I think things are kind of exciting um, in this area of forest ecology and climate change monitoring. I think that the vast majority of research has really been focused on the spring. Spring is, is, a, is, a, is a, a time when there's a lot of things happening. It's a very dramatic time when trees are leafing out, birds are arriving, insects are emerging. That's where we also have a lot of historical data. That's where our research has been concentrated. But there are actually other seasons, exciting things are happening too, and that's been largely neglected. So for example, when trees lose their leaves, when birds depart in the autumn, when insects stop flying. So this is an area which we've started to get involved in. And it turns out when we look that there are historical data sets on these phenomena, so when, for example, leaves change color um, in the autumn and people go and look at them, so there are these kinds of data sets if you look very carefully for them and you ask the right questions. And we see that climate change is already causing an effect in these areas. So trees are often keeping their leaves longer, birds are often staying longer in the autumn before they leave, butterflies are often flying for a longer period of time. But this is a very exciting area. Also, the effects of climate change on the winter. And for example, at Hubbard Brook, um, Pam Templer and her, her colleagues are doing studies on snow removal and the effects on a changing climate on how much snow is on the ground in the wintertime up at places like Hubbard Brook, or the effects of climate change on the summer. And for example, drought stress in the summertime. So these are, are areas that people are working on. It's a very exciting uh, topic for research. And one topic that we're particularly interested in our research group is the connections between bird migration and feeding times. So we know that I've mentioned that birds are staying later in many cases before leaving, but plants are, if anything, feeding at the same time or slightly earlier. And so we've been investigating this connection between bird migration and what they're eating. One of the things which is also quite amazing about our forests is that we have this huge um, influx of invasive species in the forest understory, and many of these have fleshy fruits like bittersweets, um, honeysuckles, Japanese barberry, etc. And so we were very interested if the birds are staying later and we have all these invasive species, many of which fruit after the native species, maybe the birds would be feeding very intensively on these invasive species and helping to disperse the seeds. And what we found in our recent research is that that even when birds stayed later, they were still almost exclusively eating the fruits of native species, but just searching more intensely for them and also feeding a lot on insects. And they apparently don't start eating the fruit of these invasive species until the winter time when they're almost starving. So I also want to mention one of the great opportunities for those, for those of you interested in monitoring forest processes is to think about using herbarium specimens. There's been this incredible change in the availability of herbarium specimens within the last year. Up until about a year ago, if you wanted to look at herbarium specimens, to look at phenomenon using herbarium specimens, you had to get in your car and drive all around the whole region. And we did that ourselves up until about a year ago. We often visited herbaria from the New England region. But now, all these herbarium specimens are available online. And so you can look at them on your laptop in your office. And it presents tremendous opportunities for looking at forest processes using herbarium specimens. So suppose you want to know when maple trees are leafing out, not just in your area, but across the whole region. So you can look at herbarium specimens, and herbarium specimens are often collected when the plants are flowering and fruiting. So here we have the young leaves of red maple, of a red maple herbarium specimen. We have the label here which says when it was collected and who collected it, and uh, when it was collected. And so you can use these to look at the leafing out time of maple trees across the whole eastern United States, just sitting in your office looking on your laptop. And this is just a map showing in one study that we published recently where we looked at herbarium specimens from. And you can see you have a very good rep representation of where red maples are occurring and when they're leafing out across this whole region. And, and more herbaria are coming online all the time. So you can have an even more dense map than this one. So this is something I'd all urge you all to consider. If you're looking at your local phenomenon, look at herbarium specimens to see how this is changing uh, on across the whole eastern United States. Um, another thing which, I would, which is a very exciting opportunity is using the various citizen science networks to both look at data sets, for example, when birds are migrating or trees are leafing out, 
and also to uh, propose additional kinds of observations that citizen science networks can, can use. So I think probably most of you know about this, but this is one of the great opportunities that we have right now as, as forest ecologists is to use these large networks to make observations much more widely and in greater detail than, was po than is possible for one research team. And then the final thing that I want to mention to you is that the goal of a lot of this research, I, I, I don't, probably don't have to tell this audience, the goal of research is not just to increase the amount of information, but to use it to take some action, to use it to make the forest more healthy, to convince the public of the reality of climate change, and also the need to take action. And in the research that I do, I'm constantly looking back to Thoreau for inspiration and reading the book Walden. And when I read Walden, I read Walden, the book Walden, as a climate change manual. So when I'm reading Walden, and I've read it probably 25 times in the last 15 years, and every time I read it, I think that, that there are three lessons that we take from the book Walden. One is that you should go out and observe nature carefully. So if you go out and you observe nature carefully, you will see the effects of climate change. And Thoreau in his book, he, he describes the value of living simply. So we should live simply because in Thoreau's view, so we don't need as much money and we will be healthier and better people. But also if we as individuals and as a society and as a country live simply, that's the way of dealing with the problem of climate change and generating less carbon dioxide. And the last thing is that Thoreau said we should try to affect society. So in Thoreau's time, the great issues were slavery and war. But if Thoreau was alive today, he would say one of the great issues facing society is climate change. And he would tell us that we as, as forest ecologists, as ecosystem scientists, that we should make society aware of this reality of climate change and not just stay in our narrow research institutes or universities, but get out there and talk to the public, tell them about climate change and convince them of the need for action. And so in my case, I put everything that I do about climate change into a popular book that I would hope reach an audience. Uh, and with that, I conclude my talk and also just mention that I have my book for sale. And during the uh, break afterwards, I'll be out there on the table during the coffee break and lunch um, out there with some of my copies for books to sell, if you're interested. And with that, I end and thank you very much. Questions? Yes? The graph up there was the very gross observations from the 1850s and then the later observer in the 1890s which showed a significant difference in how much evidence up there is that it's the climate changing even then you know, from other sources. Right, so, so the question is, so if you look at, throw, at the graph we had of changing um, flowering time over time, it showed that there was actually uh, a, an earlier flowering time from Thoreau's observations to Hosmer's observations in the late 19th century. And for that, we were actually able to take advantage of, you could say, a fortuitous situation, which is that Thoreau lived at the end of the Little Ice Age. So Thoreau lived in a very cold time, and then the world emerged from the Little Ice Age, and that's when Thoreau was. I uh, said so that's when Hosmer's observations were. So the climate had warmed up from the little ice age to, you could say, the present climate time. And then from Hosmer's observations to the present time, we've had this kind of second increase in temperature caused by, by human impacts. Yes, all the way back there. Yeah, when I hear about this talk, all the changes that you observed and documented, I think you have had a just well, can, you, can you just so start? Okay. Yeah, when I think about um, the speed at which climate, the changes you have observed and the speed at which climate change is accelerating, for, for, from a management perspective, I can't help but think that the some of the implications for practitioners is that things that we commonly think about in terms of how to manage, like adaptive management, really is yet less and less useful in most contexts. And we have to take where I think we're in a place now where we have to take best available science and apply it and realize that the baseline is probably going to be changing so fast that we're not going to be able to go back and, and, and assess what hasn't worked against that very same baseline. So it's just some, something to think about as a conservation practitioner to, sh to share with you all. I think yeah, right, certainly one of the things which is very frightening is the fact that we're thinking about a lot of these processes as linear processes, but then what if they are kind of exponential processes? What if there are tipping points and suddenly things change very dramatically? So that's a thing we don't know. 
Also, from the perspective of, of forest health, we have the arrival suddenly of a new insect or a new fungal disease, and this can you know, upset all of our plans because you might be managing a certain way and suddenly there's an insect or a fungus that comes in and winds up completely altering the system. Yes, so back there. You take a microphone. Thank you. I, I think I get it that you talked about assisted migration as just one tool in the toolbox, but I'm, I'm a little concerned that we, we don't want to give the impression that it should be done sort of willy-nilly without a, a lot of thought and a lot of planning that goes into it. It should be done by professionals under very rigorous conditions with extensive follow-up monitoring. And I, just, I would just like you to comment on that and just make sure, I, I just want to get that point across to folks. I think, I think no, no one would argue that research projects shouldn't be done carefully with a lot of monitoring and concern. I think that the, the field of assisted migration is, is one in which there's a lot of confusion because many people become very worried that, in, that assisted migration, that these species might become invasive and take over. And this is great concern for invasive species, whenever we remove a species. But all the examples of invasive species are, or I should say the vast majority of invasive species are species where, which have been moved between continents. And species that have become invasive within a continent, for example, maybe something like black locust or catalpa, they've been moved across, you know, hundreds of, of miles or a, thousand, or a thousand miles or more. So they've been moved great distances away from their, their press pests and predators. What we're talking about here with assisted migration is taking a, a rare declining wildflower species and moving it one or two hundred miles north of where it presently occurs. And in those situations, the great danger is that these experiments will fail. The great danger is that, that we won't be able to create new populations of, for example, Venus flytrap, rather than the Venus flytrap is going to become common and invasive and start winding around, snapping up small poodles and children. So I think that, that, that there's a lot of fear in this, and I think that a lot of the fear has been um, kind of uh, a little bit exaggerated. But of course, we should always be very concerned and careful, whatever we do. Yes? Oh, oh no, sorry. Oh, someone over there? I'm loud. I, I, I haven't seen the... Uh, there's a microphone. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen the projections out here. Is that some sort of twisted way that we should be optimistic? No, it's, 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 we shouldn't be optimistic. It's just the fact that, that with a lot of these models, people just assume that at some point, people are going to start dealing with the problem of climate change. At some point, with all of the renewable energies, with all of the uh, energy reductions, the carbon kind of capture methods, that eventually people will be able to find some way of of kind of stopping the increase of carbon dioxide and eventually maybe reducing it. But you know, that's really why these models sort of taper off of kind of which seem to be reaching a plateau. And they're also reaching a plateau at a very frightening level. So three degrees centigrade is a very, very frightening scenario. But in fact, um, you know, if we continue to put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it will increase way beyond three degrees centigrade. So we should be frightened. 